things are very complicated in a farmer's field, if things are very complicated in a forest, even if we have pretty good data. Oh, thank you for starting the recording. Whoever did that, I forgot. <laughs> um, we may have very low ecological resolution. And that depends on the how much data we collect at what spatial scale. Second, um, we tend to have very high data resolution. And a, a, an interesting question is for a particular ecological phenomenon, uh, we may um, come into a, a situation where we, we collect a huge amount of data, more than necessary. Or you might get the other problem, you might not collect enough data to detect some phenomenon uh, at the proper spatial scale. And, and the relationships can be very complex, and we'll, we'll explore that in just a moment. Okay, so uh, the next slide, uh, I think I put this slide on here, and I, I made some of these slides uh, a few weeks ago, and I only made the last couple in the last, in the last one week. <clears throat> so I think what the next slide will show, yes, is uh, a trio of graphs. And uh, all of these three graphs show different aspects of those spatial statistical phenomenon. Th these are for a farmer's field. Let's focus on this, this top graph up here for a moment. <clears throat> now, it, this is uh, a measure of soil moisture. It's what we might call um, soil electrical conductivity measured you know by some some scale and we have north uh, and west or northing and easting in this case um, now this isn't in degrees west and degrees north this is a northing and easting on a different coordinate reference system on those x and y axes but the uh, shade in the top panel refers to the measurement that's made for the apparent electrical conductivity. And we can see that the scale is very dark is low conductivity, very light is high conductivity. <clears throat> we can see that, um, that there are some areas that are very different than other areas, and there tend to be hot spots or cold spots, and they tend to be very close in space to one another. If you read the chapter, the uh, author says two things about this. One, we look at that top panel, and to the human eye, it's very obvious that there's a spatial relationship there. But he said that the human brain is uh, prone to making mistakes and seeing patterns where none exist. And, and to correct for spatial autocorrelation and other statistical phenomena, that's where the, the analysis tools come in. The middle panel, is uh, satellite data <clears throat> and it's typical satellite data within a farmer's field and it's measuring the uh, infrared reflectance on a, a multi-spectral sensor on a satellite <clears throat> um, that's in space there as well we can almost see that um, we see the low reflectance is uh, dark and the high reflectance is light and here again we see something that could be a spatial effect the upper right of that graph is dark low reflectance so we might expect um, a low amount of vegetative material there that that reflects the infrared and then there are some big white patches that have very high reflectance in the sort of middle and lower left of the graph the bottom is um, is a yield map for grains. Um, this is uh, something that's becoming more common. It's becoming a feature that is added to pieces of um, harvesting equipment. Um, and it's fascinating. Look at it. Uh, I, we work on, as some of you know, we talked about it. Me, George, Matt, and, and now Jimic are working on some potato data sets. <clears throat> and uh, we're told we have some yield maps like this, but it's been hard to get a hold of them. I mean, these are really interesting data sets, so we'll be working with, with one here. Right. This is a special thing that um, was mentioned in the, 
in the chapter. And it's this is sort of a standard um, a standard uh, thing to do with <clears throat> with um, spatial data. This uh, this is called Cressy's classification. So this is somebody in the past, an old researcher. I'm not even sure if Cressy is still alive, but there's a popular spatial GIS textbook that is long running in very um, many editions and uh, where, where these arguments were laid out that um, the classification of types of data are for geostatistical data. It's data that has an attribute of an XY coordinate tied in space with something that has a measure to it. Here, it's, I say a continuous measure, and it may be that Cressy's classification had a continuous measure. It could be something like soil moisture. It could be something like the infrared reflectance. It could be something like the count, the average count of potatoes or the average yield. OK. Another one is aerial data. These are polygons or shapes that um, that represent boundaries uh, for uh, any shape. And they're they're tied to point measurements around some boundary. And finally, there's point pattern data. If you have a series of points in space. Um, we might describe the array of the pattern uh, with point pattern data. For example, we might have a, um, a grid in space where every point is equally distant from another point. Or we might have something that's completely random where the, uh, the average distance varies a lot from point to point or the nearest point. Or we might have something that's clumped in space. This would be something like a pest outbreak where, um, where there are some hot spots. Okay, so this is the degree to which there's clumping or randomness in, in space. Now these are two examples just to illustrate a little bit further. It's an example of um, a data set the top is a geostatistical representation of some data. Here, what's being measured is the clay content in soil for its soil texture. Top is uh, geostatistical, where on the black dots, we have an actual measure of the clay content. And between the black dots, uh, here we've used a statistical method to estimate the exact uh, measure of clay. We don't have measures between each of the black dots. Here we've estimated them with a statistical model. The lower graph with the squares is a uh, aerial estimation. So we have the one measure for each dot. And we have represented the data as an area, area around each dot that's uniform. Of course, we could have the area itself is arbitrary. We could could make that a hexagon or any shape we wish. Then um, one of the final things we'll talk about before we go into some code today is the um, spatial components of data. We have the we have the spatial um, component itself, the x and y coordinate. We we may have an attribute component. So um, like with the clay data or with the infrared data, that would be the percent clay measurement. Or it might be the, um, the classification of soil texture okay, by, by for each XY point. Yet another component is the uh, scale or, or the sample size. This is really hard, this one. And uh, it also tends to change even with the same question from local area to local area. So the example in the book, the author talked about earthworms. With respect to earthworms, do you, do you measure earthworms every one meter or do you measure earthworms every 1,000 meters in order to understand what is happening spatially? You know, think about that. It's a hard problem. 
and and likewise, it's something that we talk about in the lab meetings a lot. Um, as a matter of fact, we have a spatial model that's uh, at a single plant level, but our collaborators um, talk about uh, really only wanting and needing it at every five square meters. And, and which one is best? Um, well, we don't know yet which one is best. It, it's a hard problem, uh, but it's a consideration. And then finally, uh, a real crude question, which we'll be working with a lot. In fact, we'll see some examples of it in the chapter one code is uh, the idea of vector data versus roster data. Okay, so vector data is the idea that you have points in space, x, y points in space, and if you have more than one point, if you have two points exactly, you can draw a line between them. And that line itself becomes a vector. The vector itself has no magnitude. It just shows a boundary or a point. Raster data is different. Raster data does have uh, some area effect, and a ra raster data is um, uh, when we're thinking about <clears throat> when we're thinking about um, spatial data is a little bit like a photograph where uh, the size of the pixels is arbitrary. If the pixels are big, uh, a picture might look blurry, but we have one value for each of the pixels. OK, so it's a little bit like that, um, like that uh, square clay percentage graph that I showed on the previous slide. One of the things I love most about this book, and it makes it nice, um, is uh, that the entire book is written with a focus on four data sets. And uh, there's a real analysis, warts and all, bad data and all, assumptions and subjectivity and all in this book. And, and there's even there's even an R specific subjectivity that I'll, I'll tell you about when we start to code that I, I really just love it because it um, not only does the author with a lot of mastery illustrate the concepts in the book, but also um, it, it's interesting and it, and it shows the human side of doing this kind of analysis, which is hard. It's subjective often. So the first data set is a real data set about um, this bird. It's a bird that has specific habitat requirements, the yellow-billed cuckoo in California. And um, <clears throat> uh, academic study that was done on this data set was, um, oops, <clears throat> was conducted to um, identify the association of sightings of, of the bird with uh, with features in different habitats in space. OK, so the uh, one question was what spatial features are associated with presence? So you survey area in space. Every place that you survey, you uh, document um, what habitat is there and classify it on the landscape and you document whether or not the bird is present. What they want to do with this data is um, they want to extrapolate to places they didn't survey uh, as to the likelihood of whether the bird will be present or, or could be present. OK, so it's a habitat association study. And uh, the data has shape and attribute um, uh, information. Second um, data set is oak woodland. This is a, a sparse oak woodland, it's a secondary growth. It's it probably been chopped down, probably not ideal habitat across the range of this kind of forest. This kind of forest is um, important ecologically, prevents erosion and things like that. But uh, one of the interesting things about the data set they're interested in is um, that uh, young oaks, uh, when we think in what population ecologists um, refer to uh, when they say recruitment, is the phenomenon that a, a young offspring in a population um, comes to adulthood and is able to reproduce themselves. That, that is what the term recruitment um, refers to. And what they noticed is that in some populations, recruitment is very low and in others it's very high. And the general question they want to know is why does recruitment vary 
and, and this one is just a square data set like we like we all use like our potato data set sex y coordinates and um, and some habitat characteristics so the idea is to infer um, the best habitats that are most suitable for um, oak population growth data set three is a uh, rice farming um, data set I think this is in Uruguay, but uh, <clears throat> you'll know about rice as a crop that uh, that they require a lot of water and flooding in the fields and rainy season and so forth. And um, they do undergo crop rotation and other kinds of things we're more familiar with. But um, one of the things that uh, I didn't show a picture of it, we'll, we'll come into it when we get to it, but um, we're interested in the spatial orientation of the fields. This is an important feature in this data set because what we see is that there, there are different farmers who operate an array of fields and uh, some farmers s appear to be um, more successful in terms of yield than others. And uh, a pr principal question is, well, what factors affect yield? But, but really, I would get more specific. We want to know what factors affect yield independent of spatial association. So is it that um, farmers are doing something themselves, or is it that the best farmers have the best land and are all close together? And then finally, um, data set four is, um, it's a detailed comparison of um, yield in two fields that have been managed identically. So this, this is a question to do with precision agriculture. So you know, in general, what what are the factors, the things that we can measure that can explain variation within fields? Well, I'm very interested in this. <clears throat> yeah, OK, so uh, what I'm going to do for every one of these sessions is um, I'm going to try time permitting is to go through code uh, that that is relevant in the chapters. And then at the end of every chapter, except for chapter one, there are exercises. Now, if if I learn that people are reading the chapters, we don't need to go through all the code in the chapters, then um, we'll focus on the exercises. Uh, we'll we'll let the group decide as time goes on. For today, if you want to um, follow along, we go back to the old uh, web page. I'm just going to. Um, open back up the um, <clears throat> schedule page. I'll drop the link for the schedule again in the chat. Oops. Slack. Bring up my, uh, let me stop sharing. Um, Go, stop sharing. <clears throat> I drop the schedule link in the chat just for people that <clears throat> have come laterally. And I'm just going to share again for the web page. Okay, so just to explain. Um, it's the document PDF, HTML slides right after today. Um, well, next week we'll move on to a different topic for a few weeks, but we'll come back to this in a few weeks and I'll make sure the chapter to read is up in plenty of time. Um, for the rest of these sessions, I've, download, I've, down, I've um, uploaded a zip. If I just download that and show you what's in it. There's a folder called data. If you want to follow along with my code exactly, you can unzip the folder data into your working directory. Inside there are subfolders, and inside there are all the data sets associated with each example. These are just the raw data. There's a bunch of weird file names. If you're not used to GIS assets, they're shape files. The other thing I wanted to explain is the author's code. So I've uploaded a code zip just done this, it's a little bit hard to find on the website and now the author is um, quite old and retired and their university website 
is um, it used to be really good with lots of good stuff on it, but it's doesn't exist like it used to now that they're retired. But inside this zip is um, code for all the chapters and solutions for some exercises, not all. So uh, the well, we won't look at, at these, but I just want to open chapter one and point out something that um, we're not going to focus on it in this session, but uh, we have talked about it in the past that there have been two big package ecosystems for spatial data in R. One is called SP for spatial, and the successor to SP is called SF for spatial features. And this old timer who wrote the book, um, he's really an August scientist. I shouldn't be so disrespectful. Uh, is uh, he has been around for a long time? Is has used SP? He explains in the in the chapter for most of his career and has worked to develop some of the tools in it with the primary author. But um, for the purposes of this book, um, has also adapted code to SP. And it's a good idea for us all to focus on SP, the newer one, because the uh, older one is being retired. So the um, ones that I have based this on, it, it says the original version for 1.1 and the new version. And he has code files for every section of the book where it's relevant, or at least most of them, not all of them. I've, I have found, I have to say, that not all of the code in those scripts works. And I will endeavor to make all the script the, all the code in my scripts work um, so if, if you want to follow along you can look in my code which uh, should look familiar to you but uh, i'm going to go ahead and um, unshare for just a moment quickly reshare when i have our studio up and i'll show you what my my working directory looks like <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to reshare and show you my, um, my setup. So um, I have this um, this folder that I'm just going to use to develop this. It's a little bit hard to see because of the resolution here, so maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger. Um, and what you can see is that I have uh, code and data in a folder. And this is going to be my working directory for uh, for the whole book. And so um, I've got in the data folder uh, is just an unzip of that zip file. The plant code is just an unzip of all the author's code. And then the one that is my code that you can download should just be up in the top of that folder. And I'm just going to open that now. So this is my version. A uh, little, very little original code. It's just cleaned it up and uh, make some small additions to make it work. OK, I'm going to um, now there's a new version of our studio out. I'm just going to ignore that for now and I'll make the code. Oops. I'll make the. Um, text a little bit bigger for everyone. Now, one of the things it says up here is that you notice I haven't run this code on this laptop yet, but um, did this on my desktop, but this is one of the nice things. If you haven't noticed this yet, the first time you open a folder, if, if it calls for libraries that you don't have installed, you can just install them at the click of a button, which I'm going to do. Another thing you may have noticed is that. Um, there actually is a new version of our studio and R that have recently come out within the last month or two, and um, I highly recommend the new version of our studio. You might as well um, update your R as well. I'm going to wait because it's a live recording to update my R Studio on this laptop. <clears throat> but I'm just uh, going to install these packages. The things we're installing, the packages we're installing, I'll just bring them up in the script and I'll say a word about some of them. The um, I haven't even installed the old SP library 
because I don't need it. I want to try to do the whole thing in the new one. So SF, um, ggplot, and lattice are ones that you've probably encountered with me in other classes. Ones that are specific to spatial stuff are gstat. We'll use that for doing this technique called Krieging. Terra is one that has some map tools. Stars and stars extra, those are new to me. We'll, I'll mention those when we come to them in the script. Roster is for handling roster data. Roster viz is a, uh, again, it's new to me, but it's one that the um, author uses to um, make some visualizations in the book. But one of the, my goals for going through this code is to pick up some tips and tricks to handle spatial data for my own work. And I, you know, think that that's relevant for some of you. I'm going to start by um, just loading up these libraries. Okay. Now, uh, for me, I think that um, I just want to double check that that will work for this. Home. So I'm going to have to change this set working directory for myself for this laptop. Most of my computers are set up with D for Dropbox, but this one is set up for C for Dropbox. So I'm just going to set my working directory. You can set that any way you wish. Now, one of the things that they do that he does in this chapter is a short, sharp overview. Most of the stuff he, the author, if, if you were to run the code, he wouldn't expect us to understand yet, even after having read the chapter. So I'm just going to linger over a few things. And um, with the idea in mind that we'll explore these in a lot more detail in the future. <coughs> but for now, I'm going to focus on getting to the end of the script. Um, if you like the way that I like to set up my scripts, You'll notice I've done it in the way that I, I um, prescribe. I like all of my scripts to have a header, a little bit of information, a contents that's clear, always a setup section, and uh, then the main subsections. Now there are four subsections. They're all separate scripts for the author, but I've combined them together with a little bit of extra amenity code here. Um, I found that one of the sections wasn't working because there was a bit of data that was referred to on the web that wasn't available in the form of a, of a image file, a TIFF. I couldn't find that, so I couldn't recreate that one, but all the other ones should work successfully, fingers crossed. Okay, now what, what the focus of the code in this chapter is, is to reproduce a really fast overview of some of these tools that are used to reproduce the figures in chapter one, and we'll revisit them in future chapters. Okay, so if you wanna, I've left a little breadcrumb here for you as to how to set up, you unzip the book data folder to your, to the data folder in your script working directory. I already loaded the, um, already loaded the uh, scripts and set my working directory. The figure one is not working, so I'm just gonna bypass that. We'll start at figure 1.2a. Now, this first figure that we're going to look at is that panel of three figures. It's the uh, electrical conductivity plot. And this is just a straight up constructing that plot from the raw data. And one of the first things that the author does, we're going to use it further down as he writes a custom script, a uh, custom function. So I'm just going to um, run that cross custom function. We'll come back to this later, but I'll just run it so we have it. One of the very first things he does is a very advanced statistical technique called Krieging. Um, maybe I'll just make this small until we, until we have to make it bigger. <clears throat> so we're going to read in the data set. The data will appear up here in the global environment. OK, keep your eyes up in the global environment. Three, two, one. There it is. We can see that um, there are a 
couple of uh, their easting and northing, northing. So this is one um, coordinate reference system. He also has latitude and longitude in degrees. And then there are some things that are um, measured. So at different spatial scales. <clears throat> uh, second thing is we're going to set a new variable onto this data set called ID. And uh, we're going to set that to the number of rows. So he's going to explicitly do that so that he can make a grid data object. So you can see that pop up over here in the global environment. Three, two, one. There it is. There are uh, 12,002 observations. We'll come back to that because um, one of the things of spatial data sets that um, I haven't mentioned yet is a, just a very practical one, is that they tend to be computationally expensive to do. Did somebody say something in the chat that I need to know about? <laughs> I didn't see... Uh, I didn't see no, the... no, it's just my, a picture that I sent through earlier has finally come through. <laughs> oh, OK. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't see it. Um, what we're doing here within this data set is we're slicing out the boundaries based on the or northing and easting uh, values. So this is just the four corners of the box, three, four. We're going to use those to create a grid. So um, <clears throat> I've commented out this bit. I had problems with some of this code. Um, <clears throat> but I found a solution. Um, we're setting the cell size in terms of units of that CRS. Our units will be 10, 3, 2, 1. We're just going to exploit that down below. Um, now we're going to create the grid for our square data set. OK, but to do that, we need to um, do a conversion with this function st point, which is in the SF library. And um, it just calls the um, boundaries that we've just created and makes the sort southwest and northeast boundary. Three, two, one. There we go. Now we're going to make them a, uh, those are points, and now we're going to make those a, a box with the st um, sfc function with those two points. And then we'll look at what class that object is. And we can see that it's a it's a um, class of uh, of SFC underscore point. It's an SFC class. <clears throat> in, in other words, it's a um, an object in general of a spatial feature class. And specifically, it's a spatial feature class point. We're going to use make underscore grid to um, turn that into a, a grid of values um, based on the cell size that we specified of 10. It's the resolution argument, 3, 2, 1. And then last, we're going to take the STCRS, the coordinate reference system, and assign to our grid object a specific um, coordinate reference system that we can work with. And, and we have to know this. We can't just put anything in there that we prefer. We have to know what coordinates reference system our data were collected in. It's essential to know that. Sometimes we can guess it. And uh, if we do know it, we can convert it to any coordinate reference system if we know it. With some caveats, three, two, one. OK, so let's bring the uh, screen over a little bit and see what's over here. So this is just a little function that um, is going to subsample our data. So this is my, we're going to take out so minus which um, points we know which returns integers, and we're going to do a little calculation. It's um, it's the data set ID, the row IDs divided by cell size. Remember, our cell size is 10. We set that up above. Down in the console, you can see that now. And if we divide 
a series of integers by 10. We'll have a leftover with our div division um, operator. And uh, if we have a leftover that's not zero, in other words, if it's every 10th observation, we'll have a leftover of zero because it'll be 10, 20, 30, et cetera. So we're taking out every one except every 10th value. So what we're doing in this is we're reducing the resolution. This is just for practicality, so it doesn't take forever. Three, two, one. I'm going to have to run the code faster to get through it. We've only got 10 more minutes. <coughs> and here I'm, I'm putting all that together into a um, spatial features object. Three, two, our grid that we just made into a spatial features object. Three, two, one. Bam. OK, so now I want to see our. Variogram, I'll explain that when it pops up and we'll talk about it more in future chapters. Look at the fit. And then we're going to plot our variogram and I'll linger on it and explain it a little bit. OK, but what this is, I, I was clever and made it goldenrod, but I think I'm going to take it back to black so that we can see it better. That's the trouble with goldenrod. So beautiful, but hard to see. <laughs> OK, what this is, is um, if we want to if we want to measure statistically how related things that are close together are. We um, can we can measure the semi variance and plot it like this. So the semi variance related to distance and essentially how you interpret this is that when things are more that are close together are more um, correlated with one another the semi variance will be lower and we can see here that the semi variance is lowest at very small distances those are meters on the x uh, axis and it increases from 0 to 50 and the semi variance increases right along from zero to 50. So things are becoming less related with, between the distance of zero to 50, also 50 to 100, also 100 to 150. But you know, things start not being very related to each other above 200 or so. That's how you read this, this plot. What we can do <laughs> is uh, weight it against this spatial relationship that we just measured. It's quite a lot of detail we're skimming over, but we'll come back to it so that we all understand in the future. But we can exploit this statistical relationship and uh, estimate values between the points in our grid. And that's all we're doing in this next line, the Krieging line. So if I uh, bring this down, there are a couple of arguments. We're passing into it a statistical model of that that variable that's in our data set that is married, measured on a 30 meter scale or a 30 uh, point scale. Just a plain intercept model. That's what the tilde one means. We're using our spatial features data set against our grid. And the model we're using is that variogram um, that we just did based on the fit of the uh, spatial relationship we measured. Okay, that gives us a Krieging, three, two, one. And okay, this can take a second. I hope it doesn't take too long. Now the la the second data set we do this with took a really long time, even on my fast desktop. That was okay. <clears throat> then we're gonna plot it. I'm gonna load up ggplot. I think I already did up above, so I can comment that out. And then Gigi plotted. I'm going to make the plot big to run that. This is one of the things that I had to figure out from the author's um, book. If you compare this figure to the book, you'll see that uh, this has something to do with that um, first figure with electrical conductance. It's similar to the one in the chapter that we read, similar to the one I showed, where there are some hot spots of. Um, low measure and some hot uh, some hot spots of some high measure as well spatially. Th that's why we got that Krieging value. 
if we were to look at uh, across this, we might be able to pick out some of the features from the variogram, but um, it would be very difficult. And it's one of the things that we have to, uh, it's the power really of this, the stats tools in spatial statistics that it's impossible to estimate based just on the human eye. Okay, next we're going to convert this to a raster object, just a different kind of data manipulation, I think, just to show that this is possible. So uh, this, this Hera data set. So we're going to convert this to a, uh, a um, <clears throat> roster with a ROST function. And set a grayscale. Oops, what do we do? Got to make it first, three, two, one. There we go. Now it'll work. There we go. We're going to make our grayscale here. It's just on a standard scale of 0 to 255 um, for the shade of gray. And then we're going to divide them all by 255 to make them on a scale of 0 to 1. 3, 2, 1. And then, then now this is where we call that unique function. You can look in it. I'm not going to go through it now to see the um, roster plot. And so you can see maybe just that there's a little more granularity and it's the same data set as a roster. Okay. Let's have a look at the old time here. I'm going to go real fast because I do want to finish these and you can revisit it yourself. Now I'm going to load up a TIFF data. We're going to make the, the next picture now of the uh, of some NDVI, some um, normalized uh, vegetative indices, looking at vegetation density from uh, satellite data. This line loads a um, picture from a satellite. This line sets the CRF. We're going to set our grays. We're going to set our margins. We're going to set the boundaries. We're going to look at the extent and make the Eastings. We're going to crop where we want our data to uh, be displayed. And then we're going to make a roster. This is like that um, infrared NDVI measure. It's quite a lot of data. This one looks exactly like the book. It's, it's pretty impressive. This is the kind of thing that we could do um, pretty easily. It's really easy to do that, and I'm surprised at how easy it is with these tools. They're much better than they used to be in SP, I can tell you. Now we're going to go rapidly on and do figure 1.2c. It's the last um, one. It's similar to the last one I showed you in the slides. We're going to load up again. A um, uh, This time it's a CSV file, square file of data points. 3, 2, 1. Back over so we can see. Set our ID from the row. So this is a new data set. Look at the head of our data set down in the console, 321. Establish the coordinates. And this time I'm going to set the cell size a little bit bigger so it runs faster. Um, we're going to remove um, a little bit of bias in the data set, which we'll explain in the future. And uh, um, do set up our um, a linear model that uh, that takes into account spatial relatedness. Okay. Now we're going to select every 20th value up there to Krieg. Just like before, set that up in a spatial features um, data set. Now we're going to create a grid just like we did before. Now we're going to calculate our variogram just like we did before. <clears throat> Let's plot it. So our variogram. This one looks a little bit weirder than the other one. <clears throat> it's light to see. I'll leave it as goldenrod for the sake of time. We can see there's a more extreme shoulder on this graph. So the spatial relatedness is of yield is more important than it was for the um, previous one that we did for uh, soil conductivity. So here's our creating. It's going to take a few seconds. Boom. Finished. We're going to plot it. 
this is kind of a crude spatial scale, but we can see some serious hot spots in that yield map. Serious hot spots. These are these must be like watering holes that flooded or something. Okay. We're going to add our trend back. And we're going to do the same thing in that Terra lab, just like we did before. So this is another way to visualize very similar data. We can still see the features. It's, it's literally just showcasing the, the different tools that are available here. Use the roster viz, create our shades of gray. Do something similar with the roster viz. That is a very fast introduction to some high level tools that we're going to take time to see in the future. I think that we covered so much ground and we finished right on time and I'm astonished. So uh, any comments? Oh, uh, was really good, but it looks like um, some next level. It code, is next but level. It, this is yeah. not easy stuff. It's not easy stuff, but um, I'm planning to take enough time to bring people along with me if if people want to do that. Yeah, I was able to run it all. Yes. Um, the only thing I, I had a problem with was that my data um, working directory. I did take some pains to make that code so that it would run. <laughs> it took me a little bit myself. I could run it too along good yeah and basically my comment is who needs arcgis any longer <laughs> you know the sf package is it's just gone from strength to strength and it is it's so much easier now than it used to be and, and krieging we just did two runs of krieging that's not easy it's not easy for me but the code is very small for us to achieve that of course we need the data and it needs to be in the right format and it needs to be decent data. But having said that, you're right. Who needs ArcGIS? I'm with you. All right, I'm going to uh, stop the recording. I think we've got enough there. Thanks so much for remembering that.